Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for the Baby's First Test webinar series. We are so excited today to be able to present Putting Babies First, um, Iowa Newborn Screening Program's uh, Baby's First Test Challenge Award. Just to give a bit of background about the Challenge Awards, um, we all know that the newborn screening community is one of a lot of inno innovation and excitement. So in that tradition, Baby's First Test really was looking for a way to engage and inspire the community. And we've done that through our Challenge Awards. We've done this for two years, and we are planning on doing this again, um, doing another round of applications later in the fall. Um, this year, we uh, distributed several awards up to, but not necessarily, uh, $20,000 to a range of different organizations to integrate Baby's First Test into new or existing outreach, engagement, or educational efforts. Um, each year we really look for really innovative solutions that we can see will be able to be sustainable even after this funding has gone. Um, and so um, one of our challenge awardees that we are happy to present today is the Putting Babies First project. I will introduce everyone um, who will be participating in that presentation and then they will jump right in and get going. If you have any questions, please feel free to send them in, and we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. So um, we have Erin Ogare, um, who is currently a doctoral candidate in the health communications at the Adler School of Journalism and Communications at the University of Iowa. Erin has been involved with the State Hygienic Lab and Newborn Screening since 2011, where she served as a health communications fellow and began the Put in Baby First project. Then we have Mike Ramirez, who has a BS in microbiology from Iowa State University. Mike currently serves at the, as the supervisor for the Newborn Screening Lab at the State of Iowa and has worked with the State Hygienic Lab in Newborn Screening for 12 years. We have Carol Johnson, um, who has been the Iowa Newborn Screening Coordinator since September 2011. Prior to that, she had been involved with the Iowa Newborn Screening Program in an administrative role since 2005. Carol is also the administrator in the Division of Medical Genetics in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. Lastly, we have Petya Eckler. Um, who received her master's degree and PhD from the Missouri School of Journalism at the University of Missouri. She has worked as an assistant professor in the Adler School of Journalism at the University of Iowa and currently serves as a health communications lecturer at the University of Strathclyde um, in Glasgow, Scotland. So with that, um, to our speakers, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the Putting Babies First educational video webinar. Um, I am Erin O'Gara, and I'm going to start out with just kind of a brief overview of what we wanted to achieve when we set out making this video. Um, the educational video really grew out of a health communications fellowship that I had at the lab. Uh, we decided that in working in newborn screening, the area that we really wanted to improve upon the most was to reduce the number of invalid specimens that we were receiving in Iowa. And when we started doing this, we decided to um, really set out looking at what some of the communication barriers were, the issues that uh, individuals who were collecting specimens in the field were facing, concerns they had. And we wanted to try to access the greatest number of people we could through social media and presentations, um, again, with the goal in mind of reducing the number of invalid specimens so that we could um, give as many babies in Iowa as we could with the best possible start at life. When we started this video, we um, were fortunate enough to work with several partnerships. Of course, we um, here at the State Hygienic Laboratory, we're sort of the main organizers of everything. The University of Iowa School of Journalism and Mass Communication partners with us, as did the University of Iowa Communications and Marketing, who helped us create the video and some of the promotional materials. The University of Iowa Children's Hospital works with the State Hygienic Lab to perform screening and follow-up. And the Iowa Department of Public Health serves as um, they sort of administer the whole 
newborn screening program that we have. When we first got started with this project, we wanted to see what some of the main barriers and challenges were for people who were collecting the specimens. We knew that the number of invalid specimens that we were getting wasn't just due to negligence. It was probably that there were some issues that we were unaware of going on. Um, to assess this, we held sur or we conducted surveys with a nurses, phlebotomists, and lab employees around the state of Iowa really to assess their knowledge on newborn screening, newborn screening procedures, and their attitudes toward newborn screening. After we obtained that information, we used some of the feedback that we got from that to hold focus groups with nurses and phlebotomists at our two lab facilities, um, the, the main lab facility and then the facility where we actually perform the, uh, the screening for the blood spot specimens that we get. With the focus groups, our goals were really to understand what people were familiar with, um, questions that they had, areas where they might be feeling a lot of frustrations toward the process, and insight into specimen, specimen collection. Excuse me. Uh, the feedback that we got from especially the focus groups was really fantastic. People were um, so much more appreciative and understanding of the process when they saw how it went on our end and the reason that some of the regulations were in place. Um, we learned that some of the things that we thought were going to be issues really were not at all. People were very familiar with those. They um, completely understood them. And things that we had kind of taken for granted turned out to be information that was kind of lacking in a lot of the training or just knowledge and procedures that most employees who collected specimens went through. Uh, the information that we obtained from this led us to the decision that it would be best to make a short educational video um, just to cover some of these main topics. Although there were some really, really great information sources available for uh, procedures in newborn screening, we found through our research that not a lot of people were very familiar with these and that sometimes they were hard to access, especially in um, in facilities that maybe had more limited budgets. And so with the creation of a free, short educational video, we hope to cover some of, some of the gaps in this knowledge. When we shot the video, we decided to set it in sort of a question-answer format where we covered the main topics, um, main topics that were brought up during the focus groups and in the surveys. We shot these with um, people who were lab lab practitioners and with nurses and um, lab employees in several hospitals around Iowa. We shot in three different locations in Iowa, and we were able to actually get footage of newborns with parents and um, a couple of different examples of the heel stick procedure, which was really fantastic. Um, during this process, we worked with the University of Iowa video production and we worked a lot with hospital um, public relations representatives who were really helpful and wonderful. And they worked a lot with the parents in getting us um, informed consent and those signed releases to use the footage of uh, their new babies in the hospital. We, with this information, made a couple of different uh, social media outreach activities. Um, the first that we did was a short promotional video that um, we were able to do because of parent involvement with one very sweet little baby. We used a free video service, Animoto, and this video is pretty short, so I'll see if I can show you here. This one was really um, targeting parents more than the practitioners, and it's just kind of an informational uh, little spot about newborn screening. <coughs>
We had a really great response to the short video that we posted, and because of its length and the target audience, um, it we think led a lot of people to check out the website and obtain more information on Baby's First Test. Uh, the main video that we created, and I won't show all of this, I'll just kind of introduce it, um, was a YouTube video that we promoted through different hospitals and through um, our Facebook page in addition to a lot of other organizations that we will um, address a little later on. We unveiled this, uh, the video, at the Association of Public Health Laboratories annual meeting in May 2012. Um, really fantastic that we were able to reveal it there. We um, screened it. We could hand out flyers and um, copies of the video, and we got a great response there. We also showed part of the video at the American Public Health Association video conference in October of 2012. Um, it was accepted into a conference of um, several different videos in education and prevention. Um, and we will also be showing the video and presenting on the entire um, baby, Putting Babies First project at the CDC um, conference this coming August. First million babies are born in the United States each year. More than 5,000 arrive on the Genetic or Metabolic Commission. By obtaining a few drops of blood through a slow quick collection, babies can be screened for the condition during the first few days of life. The results could mean early detection and treatment of conditions that otherwise could cause irreversible neurological damage, coma, or death. Every day, healthcare professionals throughout the country collect red spots for babies. The specimen is then sent to the public health laboratory to be. So, just a little, um, little glimpse at our video. Uh, you are free to access the video on YouTube, and we'd love for you to see it. Uh, we promoted the project and um, and the video and the various other outreach activities that we were doing through social media. We created a um, Putting Babies First Facebook page where we released a lot of information on newborn screening advances and newborn screening information around the country. We also were able to blog um, Baby's First Test with Genetic Alliance, and we tweeted about Baby's First Test through the State Hygienic Lab Twitter account. Hi, I'm Mike Ramirez, the Newborn Screening Lab Supervisor for Iowa. Um, we did get a lot of media uh, coverage. The publicity surrounding the video did generate interest from the press in our state. Um, we had some opportunities that we otherwise would not have had to showcase the newborn screening program in Iowa and to inform the general public about screening. Um, in July of 2012, a Des Moines Register reporter came to the newborn screening lab to learn more about newborn screening and, and to cover the news about the award and the educational video that we produced. We were able to accommodate the taking of several photos of personnel uh, performing the lab testing. Kim Piper, our state genetics coordinator, and I were asked a few questions about newborn screening in general. And we were both able to emphasize the, the importance of having your baby screened. In December of last year, the Cedar Rapids Gazette also did a similar story. Um, in their story, they featured a family in Iowa that had several children with PKU, and uh, they told about their experiences and uh, growing up with the condition and, and how grateful they were that uh, newborn screening was around. Also in December, the Big Ten Network came to do a feature for their Live Big TV show. They wanted to do a story about the collaboration at the University of Iowa between the State Hygienic Lab and the Department of Journalism in producing the video. They shot quite a bit of footage in the lab and, and interviewed Aaron, me, 
and our lab director, Chris Atchison. And they featured another family in Iowa with a child found to have a disorder through screening. And this family, too, was very grateful that we were able to identify their child's condition. So um, those were opportunities we had. Um, there were some phone calls, too, that we had to, to deal with. And uh, we certainly wanted to promote the, the video and uh, did so. And also coinciding with uh, the production of this video was APHL's uh, campaign to promote the 50th year of newborn screening in the U.S. And uh, I think that helped keep uh, newborn screening on the minds of those we were trying to reach. And it certainly, I think, did for the general public and uh, to, to the legislators in the state. We, Iowa was able to host the APHL traveling exhibit in April, and we were able to, to put that exhibit at our state capitol and our administrative offices in Des Moines. And uh, I think that, that helped uh, keep uh, newborn screening, at least in Iowa, on the forefront. Um, when we started thinking about what we were going to do for uh, education, it was kind of a project that was going to be just for Iowa. It kind of expanded to, you know, with the Challenge Award to a larger audience. But at first we were thinking about a video, um, you know, a way to, to demonstrate the technique. And, uh, but I, I let Aaron know that um, there already was a collection video made by the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, or CLSI, and we were already using that. Uh, to uh, provide to hospitals to improve their collection practices. So we decided to take another approach, and that was the, the question and answer format that Aaron alluded to. And uh, we saw that as a good way to educate about the collection process, and it, it certainly is a process. There are important factors that those doing the collecting need to keep in mind. So um, in the video, we wanted to emphasize when to collect, uh, knowing that the timing of the collection can affect the accuracy of the results in um, certain circumstances uh, like transfusion where, or the early discharge of a baby from the hospital where uh, you uh, would, may want to collect earlier than what's advised. Um, we all wanted to touch on the preferred way to collect, the direct application of the, the blood to the filter paper card and uh, how that is preferred and uh, other collection procedures like capillary tube that could be used if it, if it is done correctly. We wanted to mention drying of the specimen, the length of time to dry, um, avoiding hot, humid conditions with the blood all the way from the collection clear through the uh, shipping of the specimen to the laboratory, um, and contamination issues, you know, where are they drying the specimen? Uh, on the bench top, if they're drying on the bench top, is there anything uh, that could contaminate that filler paper? Because it is very absorbent and it will readily uh, contaminate. Um, we did have a uh, contamination issue that we've had to work through with a, a hospital in Iowa where that was the case, where a disinfectant they were using on the bench top and around the, the newborn screening specimens that were drying did contaminate uh, specimens and ended up. Uh, demonstrating uh, false positive results in the mass spec panel for some of those markers. So very important to, uh, to pass that information along. Um, we wanted to let the audience know what an unsatisfactory specimen was. So we, we tried to show pictures in the video of what an unsatisfactory specimen would look like. And uh, so to help them make a good judgment about whether or not they should even send the specimen to us or recollect right away while the baby's still in the hospital. Um, uh, the issues uh, surrounding uh, premature babies was also mentioned and uh, the fact that, that most of, or not mo many of these, these premature babies are transfused and that affects how and when uh, the child should be collected. We wanted to make the audience aware of the CLSI collection standard document in the video uh, it does provide uh, good guidelines for the collection, and we wanted to encourage uh, the hospitals and clinics to use this standard if at all possible. So 
So, oh, so overall, we saw the video as another tool we could use to help hospital and clinic staff collect a good specimen and hopefully to incorporate that in their in-house training program. I'd like to thank uh, Pat Timmons for the nice job she did in the video collecting or answering the questions um, and also to the newborn screening lab staff at the hygienic lab for the taking time out of their schedules to work with the reporters and the videographers. I think they all did a wonderful job. So that's it for me. Uh, Carol is up next. Hello everyone, this is Carol Johnson and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to talk more specifically about uh, the partnerships and the education that we did when we began our SCID pilot. So SCID is Severe Combined Immunodeficiency. We started our pilot in, on June 3rd of 2013, but we began to work on our education and awareness campaign much before that. So first we partnered with the University of Iowa Children's Hospital, which also happens to be the place where the newborn screening follow-up staff are housed, as well as all of our medical consultants for the various disorders are housed. We utilize the Putting Babies First social media platforms to announce the Iowa Skid pilot. Um, it was already in existence. It already had a great audience, and we thought we'd have the best uptake using that. And we also increased our partnership with the State Hygienic Lab in the education and the PR that they're able to do from the lab itself. So we began working on developing our awareness and education campaign soon after we knew that Iowa was indeed going to screen for SCID. We launched our campaign in September of 2012, and that campaign included a live videotape presentation by our SCID medical consultant that was given at Pediatric Grand Rounds, and I'll talk more about why we did that in a moment. We also sent emails out to physicians and ARMPs in Iowa, and we also did a mass mailing. And we did do a target audience here. The physicians were OB-GYNs, pediatricians, and family medical providers, family medicine providers, as well as ARNPs. We had articles published in various newsletters, like the Iowa Academy of Pediatrics quarterly newsletter. We used an insert in our program brochure. We did some press releases. And then, as Mike mentioned, some of the Des Moines Register and Cedar Rapids Gazette um, stories really helped, and we utilized social media. So we started our pilot, as I said, June 3rd of 2013. Since that time, we've had approximately 49 contacts with either birthing facilities, primary care providers, or laboratorians. And despite our best efforts, we have found that most of the facilities really had not heard about the SCID pilot. Because when we're calling, we're trying to ask, did you know that we were doing SCID? Um, only one person said that they had heard about the SCID implementation, and that was because they had read the, just the standard letter that we had mailed to them. So we'll have to think about what we can do better next time. Um, we did put that live presentation that our doc, Dr. Pisano, our medical consultant, did. We did post that on YouTube, um, on the Baby's First Test YouTube site and the Iowa Academy of Pediatrics uh, YouTube site, and it has been viewed 154 times. Um, I'm not an expert on the uptake, if that's good or bad or indifferent but at least we know that there have been some people who have watched that video. So what we've learned, we've learned that the communication to the individuals, to those primary care providers and the ARNPs, really didn't work that well, unfortunately. And what we've learned is that we need to continue to improve our efforts to reach out specifically to the birthing facilities. And I would say we really need to target the NICUs as Mike mentioned, there's a lot of um, work that's done in newborn screening that's specifically with our premature babies. 
And uh, so we need to really make sure all of the NICU staff understand what we're doing in newborn screening and about any new disorders. And also those hospital laboratorians that are tasked with collecting the screen and maybe the repeat screens that we ask for. The, on a positive note, the collaboration that we did with our state stakeholders and our national stakeholders was really successful and actually very rewarding. And um, it has really set, set the stage for us to do further collaborations with them in the future. It was, it was really great. Um, the bottom line is that you can never stop educating. Uh, we, not just about SCID, but about newborn screening in general. So that continues to be um, one of the jobs on my, my plate that I need to work on. What we know is that, and I mentioned this already really, that there's still much to do regarding newborn screening awareness and education. We have a lot of parents that really know very little about newborn screening and has ne have never really heard about it until they get that call from their doctor that says that something's maybe not right. So that's not good. We need to work on that. We know we must reach out to our parents and educate them. We need to specifically reach out to OB-GYN providers because right now they're really not part of our newborn screening system. We need to make them part of the system and collaborate with them so that we can make sure that newborn screening education occurs in the prenatal period. And we also need to continue to work on fostering our relationship with those local pediatrician and family medicine providers so that we're working together for the greater good of the baby. And that's it for our talk. Um, thank you all for listening. And uh, Natasha, are we ready to open it up for questions now? Yes, we are. So please, and we've gotten a couple questions come through, but if you have any questions, please use um, your panel bar to type them in, and I will read them out. Um, one of the first questions we got, and I think you touched upon this a little bit, but maybe if you could be a bit more specific, that would be helpful, is what were the major problems in terms of um, specimen collection that you were facing that really pushed you to say, okay, we really need to create a video? <clears throat> yeah, the, some of the major problems, I think, are just in the way the, the phlebotomist or the the nurse collects the sample and applies it to the, the filter paper. You know, if they, if they haven't given us enough blood to work with, uh, if, it, if the blood doesn't soak through the filter paper all the way, so we're not left with a, a good sample that way. Or if they, if they just apply too much blood, you know, to where you get, you get layering and, and clotting of the blood on the filter paper. Um, the contamination issue. Uh, not only applies to uh, chemicals or substances that might uh, get on the card, but um, it applies to you know when you if you have to collect the blood through an IV line or something. So those were uh, things that we wanted to address. So those are kind of the major issues we we have to deal with every day in the lab. And um, so hopefully the video was able to address some of that. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, if you could elaborate a little bit about both the benefits and or challenges of having that additional media coverage. It was, was it something that you had anticipated or was it kind of a surprise and you felt like you had to um, scramble to, to address it? Yeah, that's tough for people in the lab. I mean, it's not something we're trained in and certainly used to. And uh, um, you do get all nervous and tense when uh, you know that you're going to have to do this, uh, and uh, you know every time Pat Blake, who's our public information officer here at the Hygienic Lab, calls me up, I'm always like, "Oh no, here we go again." <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess you get used to it after a while, and it's something we have to do. And if it's for the greater good, we we want to do that. Um, when we know they're coming. Uh, you know, we don't always know the questions that they're going to ask us because sometimes it's just a reporter coming or calling us on the phone and they're they're asking us questions. So um, for me, I guess I just try to have in mind just general answers to general questions about newborn screening seems to work pretty well. Um, 
uh, when they come, the camera uh, videographers and the reporters come in the lab, we try to have simple examples to show them, you know, of maybe the, the specimens getting punched, you know, what the blood spot looks like, um, action photos of uh, individuals doing the testing where there might be movement going on and, and um, something that, that the camera could easily show. So um, that's kind of what we try to focus on when they come in, but, but it is, it's not an easy thing at all uh, to have the media come into your laboratory and start asking questions and, and shooting pictures. It's, it's, uh, it's something I don't think we'll ever really get used to. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, how much time did running this project take? Um, you guys clearly did a lot in terms of videos and um, also just managing and making, uh, strengthening your partnership with other groups. But, you know, do you feel like this was taxing or um, if you could just talk about the time and who worked on what? Um, this is Erin here. Uh, you know, I wouldn't describe it as taxing, but it has definitely been a time-intensive project. Um, I'm glad this question came up because I wanted to mention we're actually still working on it now. Uh, we're still maintaining the social media information. We're always updating that, and uh, we are able to obtain um, quantitative metrics from that so we can actually assess um, the impact of the information that we're getting out there, how the chances of it going viral, how much... Um, People are talking about it, coming to look at us. So the actual video has been a like two-year-long project now. Um, so the time, I think, has been quite a bit. The actual shooting of the video probably took around 10 hours, I would say, in all at the various locations, um, and then was edited down to our, our short little YouTube video. The research um, ahead of that was really um, several months in, in the planning, but all in all, the video has been about um, a two-year-long project. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Um, and you started to touch on this, but um, can you talk about how you plan to continue this initiative or how it's um, been incorporated into some of the other work you did? I, I really liked seeing um, how you used the Putting Babies First project um, with the work you were doing around SCID, but you know, are there other examples of that? Um, you know, we are trying to maintain this all the time, so it's not something that is just limited to the video. We really wanted, when we set out to do this, to create better communication between um, us at the lab, uh, sort of the testing side, and the people who are collecting the specimens, and parents of babies, and, and increasing knowledge about newborn screening in general. So we're sort of always trying to continue that conversation. We are um, still maintaining our uh, social media, and so every time that there's new information that comes out, um, really about any aspect of newborn screening around the country, we try to promote that. We try to link up with a lot of different organizations and um, testing facilities around the country, including hospitals that test in um, different states and in um, different regions of the country. We were able to partnership to do the partnership with the skid testing and um, the 50th anniversary of a newborn screening really because of the timeline. We hope to continue that kind of thing with all of the new advances that we, um, that we experience in newborn screening. So it's, it's really an ongoing educational project and um, we, we plan on this being a, um, a new way to communicate between, between labs and testing facilities. Great, thank you. Um, so we have had a request um, to show the whole video. Um, how long is it? I think it's about 10 minutes. Um, so we will put that up, but actually we just have another question come in asking um, if you had different challenges working in um, kind of lower resource environments such as, you know, working with rural birth centers or if you could just talk about what was the outreach like to the different people you did outreach to.
Um, yeah, in Iowa, we we have a variety of sizes of, of birthing centers, certainly, and and um, you know, any any chance I get to talk to these folks, I you know, I, I am now including the the link to this video and uh, encouraging them to use that. But you know, we talk to to uh, people who are collecting every day, and uh, it's usually just you know word of mouth most of the time where I'm explaining to them why you know the specimen may be unsuitable um, when you know how to collect and, and so forth so it's it's great this video will provide uh, something more tangible that they can actually look at and um, hopefully keep in their arsenal and, and, and help them send or collect better specimens um, I would like to just add on that a little bit um, Mike, when he was talking earlier, mentioned the CLSI handbook, and what we found in some of the preliminary research that we were doing was, this is a really fantastic resource, by the way, um, really thorough, very, very good. What we found when we were doing some of the research, um, we initially were sort of under the assumption that everyone had these materials, everyone was viewing them all the time, and what we found were um, sometimes in some of the um, the facilities that were a little bit more strapped for cash or had smaller budgets, the materials were very expensive and a lot of them didn't have them. And in some of the larger facilities where um, things were very busy, it was much more fast paced, the training often took place um, just from one, uh, one nurse, one phlebotomist to another. So there wasn't really a formal training procedure in place. And um, those were things that we didn't really anticipate at first, and that was part of what led us um, to, to decide that having something that was um, short, very direct, that um, really got to some of the biggest areas of confusion and the problems that we had available online would be a, a good way to go. Great, thank you. Um, I believe those are all the questions that we have. So um, before we go and play the video, um, which is about 10 minutes, um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we will be sending out a link to the um, archived version of this webinar. Um, and it will be posted. So for people who weren't able to join, um, well, they will be able to join or they will be able to view the webinar at a later time. And we will let everyone know when that is available. We also would like to announce a save the date for a meeting that Genetic Alliance is putting on on August 20th in DC, a one day meeting um, entitled Beyond the Blood Spot, How Emerging Technology um, Will Affect Detection and Clinical Care. So with that, um, we are putting up the video now. Um, if you still have some questions, feel free to send them in and we will definitely get them answered by our speakers um, more directly through email. Thank you so much. This is really wonderful. All right. So we're just getting it up, the video up right now since we had a request for that. Thank you, Sean. Four million babies are born in the United States each year. More than 5,000 arrive with a genetic or metabolic condition. By obtaining a few drops of blood through a heel prick collection, babies can be screened for these conditions during the first few days of life. The result could mean early detection and treatment of conditions that otherwise could cause irreversible neurological damage, coma, or death. Every day, healthcare professionals throughout the country collect blood spots from babies. The specimen is then sent to the public health laboratory to be screened for at least 29 different conditions. However, without following the correct procedure of collecting these samples, laboratories cannot process the results properly, which potentially delays vital treatment for newborns. Laboratory scientists can answer many of the questions 
questions that may arise during the blood spot collection and offer important information to help ensure specimens arrive at the lab ready for screening. Why is it so important to wait and collect the blood spot specimen 24 hours after birth? Shouldn't the blood spot specimen be collected as soon as the baby is born? 24 hours is the optimum time for collecting blood spots to re obtain accurate results on those tests. There are uh, three instances where we would like it drawn before that. One is if the baby's going to be transfused, then we would like it drawn prior to the 24 hours, and then a repeat done after the transfusion. Another time would be if the baby's going home within the 24 hours, and a third time would be if that baby's being transferred out to another hospital. Once a blood spot specimen is collected, does it need to dry before being sent to lab? Yes, it needs a minimum of three hours for drying time, and then it should be sent to the lab within 24 hours after being collected. And one of the um, items that we that's available is what's called the drying rack, and that way you can put those specimens on there so that they're not touching anything, they're not on the bench, because any of those touching each other can cause contamination, or putting on a bench can cause contamination. So you can set them in here, let them dry for three hours, and then send them. Keeping the, the specimens in a horizontal position while they're drying is important. Um, so the blood will dry uniformly. And also it gets them up off of the uh, bench top so that they won't get contaminated with anything. Sometimes it's not possible to collect blood from the baby's heel. Can other methods be used? The heel stick is still the preferred method. It's important not to do the arch, do the ears, do the fingers on the baby, because that's too dangerous. But the heel stick is still the preferred method, as long as you are not contaminating the filter paper in any way. Sometimes babies move around a lot when you're trying to collect the blood from the uh, baby's heel. And what are the best ways to get that blood? Can you use other devices to get the blood on the filter paper without scratching it? The heel stick is still the preferred method for dropping the blood on the filter paper. However, you could use the capillary tube. The important thing is to drop it immediately so it doesn't have time to clot and do not touch the filter paper with that tube or you will scratch it. Um, another item to keep in mind is do not use an anticoagulant tube because that will interfere with the results of the test. With newborn screening, we collect blood samples from preterm as well as full-term babies. And we know that sometimes with the preterm babies, there are some special considerations. Can you tell us about those? The preterm babies you can collect prior to 24 hours if you believe there's going to be a transfusion. And then if you do that, you would have to recollect after the transfusion. If it is not possible to do it before the transfusion, then you would have to wait and do it after the transfusion, but then another one eight weeks after that last transfusion. What are the most common reasons that the lab would consider the specimen unsatisfactory? Some of the most common reasons for rejecting a specimen would be layering. If you're dropping the blood, you don't want that blood to overlap one another. A quantity not sufficient, be sure and check both sides of your form that the blood has soaked through on both sides of the filter paper. Quantity not sufficient would be also if there isn't enough blood, you just put a tiny little drop in that circle and we don't have enough to get a valid punch clotting. And the clotting is usually do if you're using a capillary tube and you're dropping it and you're leaving it in that tube too long and it starts to clot. Serum separation can occur if you're pumping the heel of that baby and you're dropping the blood, then you have the tissue being mixed in with the blood, and separation can occur. Contamination. You can have contamination when you take your gloves off while you still are working with the specimen, holding it, even though you've collected the blood, because your hand has oil, or maybe you've had hand cream on it, and that can cause contamination. And then one other item that once in a while will get an expired form. All the forms have an expiration date. So be aware of that, and um, that would be rejected if you used it. We realize you can't you can't be perfect in collecting specimens, and and uh, while this one certainly looks better as far as the, the circles being filled, we're not going to uh, dismiss it, all samples if they're 
if they're not completely with, uh, filled in, within the circle. And uh, here's an example of a blood spot specimen where we consider it acceptable. We feel we're getting an, an adequate, valid uh, sampling from it. What other steps can collectors take to make sure that the best possible specimen is sent to the laboratory? You need to check the information on the form, make sure that all of it is complete before sending it. You need to properly train the staff in collection. And one of the tools that is handy for doing that training is the one that is um, from the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. You need to dry that specimen, keep it away from bench tops. You don't want them touching one another, and they need a minimum of three hours of drying time. Keep it away from heat, humidity, and sunlight and then ship it off to your lab within 24 hours after collection. All right, so this is the log invention. This is where it all begins. So what happens when we receive these specimens in the lab is the staff evaluate the demographic information and make sure that we have certain key components, like name of the baby, facility, and date of birth. Um, once we've verified that that information is available, then we evaluate the blood spot quality. And the blood is protected by this flap, so we pull this back and we evaluate the front, and then we flip it over and we evaluate the back. And if both sides are um, okay, then the specimen is then passed along based on one person's assessment of the blood. However, if one lab staff member looks at this and says, mm, I don't know, I think there's something wrong with this, the specimen is then independently evaluated by a second lab staff member, and based on their evaluation of the blood spot card, if both can agree that it is poor quality or unsatisfactory, it is then assigned poor quality or unsatisfactory. By following these important procedures, you are a critical first link to a healthy start in life. Accurate collection of blood spots allows laboratories to quickly identify potential congenital conditions. Together, you and the lab technician help ensure a healthy life for the new infant in a process known as baby's first test. To learn more about newborn screening, parents can go to www.babiesfirsttest.org. This comprehensive one-stop shop includes information about the screening process, a clickable map listing each. OK, great. Um, sorry for the choppiness of the video. I think showing video through uh, webinar can be difficult. But I did send out to everyone a link to the site, uh, to the YouTube page that has this listed. You can also find it on um, babiesfirsttest.org. And with that, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. We had some great questions. And particularly, thank you so much to all of our speakers. It was really great to be able to share um, the work that you've done with the Putting Babies First project. And hopefully, a lot of other states and um, departments of health will be able to use this information. We will have another Babies First Test webinar um, in September. So please keep a lookout on information for that. And with that, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.